to welcome everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce one of our own today, Dr. Creighton Don from the Division of Cardiology. So a little background on Dr. Don. He's originally from California. He has a bachelor's degree in English literature and computer science from UC Berkeley. He then earned a PhD in English language and literature at the University of Michigan. But I think there was a little bit of interest in medicine at that time. Um, his PhD dissertation was The Borderlines of Sympathy, Race, Medicine, and Romanticism. Uh, he then pursued a medical degree at UCSF, followed by uh, medicine residency training at Chicago, and then cardiology fellowship here at the University of Washington. Uh, that was followed by interventional cardiology fellowship at Mass General Hospital. He then joined faculty at UW. He's currently an assistant professor and the director of the Interventional Cardiology and Structural Heart Fellowship. He has earned several awards, uh, including best resident teacher, as well as research grants from the John L. Locke Foundation Charitable Trust and the Vascular Biology Working Group. He teaches in the medical school and organizes the Interventional Cardiology Fellowship lecture series, as well as the hands-on cath lab workshop. He's involved in research focusing on interventional cardiology, as well as research in stem cell-derived cardiac grafts, has written multiple articles and book chapters on, this, on these issues. He's here today to talk to us about left atrial appendage closure for atrial fibrillation, the end of warfarin, question mark. Please help me welcome Dr. Creighton Dahl. Thank you. Uh, so it's really my honor to be presenting at Medicine Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist, been practicing here for the past six years, and I specialize in what's called structural heart disease. Uh, there's been a revolution within our field over the past few years uh, with advancements in material science, uh, engineering of, of miniaturized devices. We're now able to treat patients with uh, minimally invasive techniques, to replace their valves, to repair their valves, to repair intracardiac defects using uh, minimally invasive devices that would treat patients who were previously deemed inoperable. And we've seen a logarithmic growth in these device-based procedures over the past five years. Uh, today, I will discuss the use of left atrial appendage closure devices to help reduce strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, for a very long time, atrial fibrillation has centered around anticoagulation. What I will share to you, with you today represents a paradigm shift in our thinking about preventing strokes in these patients, in which we can actually modify the anatomical substrate which may predispose patients to stroke, rather than simply suppressing uh, thrombus formation. There are two main points that I'd like to leave you, leave you with today. First, uh, appreciation for the risk of stroke and the seriousness of atrial fibrillation and yet the inherent limitations of anticoagulation in this patient population. And secondly, an understanding of the anatomic relationship between strokes and atrial fibrillation, as well as an appreciation for how device-based therapies may benefit these patients. I've subtitled my talk, The End of Warfarin, to be provocative, uh, as certainly there will be a role for warfarin in the present and future in clinical practice. But by the end of the talk today, I hope that you can appreciate the value of device-based therapies and anatomic substrate modification and how this may benefit patients. I have no disclosures. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, we will talk briefly about atrial fibrillation and stroke. I'll talk about left atrial anatomy and the mechanisms for stroke. We'll discuss atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation as well as the limitations of this approach in these patients. I'll discuss left atrial appendage closure and stroke prevention and the clinical studies of validating this. And we'll talk about future direction. So first, with regard to atrial fibrillation and stroke. We know that many people in the US, over 6 million, have uh, strokes with an incidence of about 800,000 a year. Uh, the lifetime risk is quite high in patients above age 50. It's one in five for uh, women, one in six for men. And stroke symptoms affect approximately 20% of patients above age 45. So there's probably some underestimation from this data, if you include TIAs and other neurologic impacts. And stroke is the leading cause of disability in the US. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the US when you break it out from other cardiovascular uh, causes. 
and it's the second leading cause of death in the world. Uh, we know that stroke mortality uh, uh, affects older patients uh, more so than younger patients. Here you can see in the light green that for the older pa patient substrata, that the one-year mortality after having a stroke is quite high across uh, ethnicities. We also know that atrial fibrillation is quite prevalent, uh, with between 2.7 and 6.1 million patients in the U.S. having this. This is likely an underestimation, uh, given that uh, there have been several studies looking at patients with no clinical diagnosis of atrial fibrillation who are found to have subclinical atrial fibrillation. And in fact, some studies where patients have gotten pacemakers who have not had a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, between 10 to 30 percent of them have atrial fibrillation seen on those pacemakers. We know also that in these patients with subclinical atrial fibrillation, that their stroke rate is twice as high as those same po patient population who do not have this subclinical atrial fibrillation. In patients above age 80, about 80% 80 of them have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation at some point in their lifetime. And so what is the relationship of atrial fibrillation with stroke? Overall, if you have atrial fibrillation, there's approximately a four to five fold increase in your risk for stroke. It's similar across the board, whether it's paroxysmal, persistent, or permanent atrial fibrillation. And we know that if you have atrial fibrillation, that your risk for more severe strokes is higher, or even for recurrent strokes as well. This graph table here shows the proportion of attributal risk uh, by, by age strata. You can see the prevalence of, of atrial fibrillation increases as patients get older. What's most striking about this table is that by, in patients age 80 to 89, that the attributable risk of atrial fibrillation to their strokes, and again, this is a patient population that has the highest mortality and highest impact of the strokes, is approximately 20%. So 20% of strokes in the 80-year population we can attribute most likely to atrial fibrillation. You can see here that that's described in another slide. What's being shown here across uh, these columns are addition of risk factors. So in column A would be a uh, normal tensive patient. Column B would be the stroke risk in a hypertensive uh, patient. Column C would be if you add diabetes to hypertension. In D, if you had cigarette smoking, diabetes, and blood pressure together, what your stroke risk is. And you can see by the time you get to column E, when you add atrial fibrillation to this mix, that your stroke risk doubles uh, in this group, suggesting again the high impact of atrial fibrillation on the occurrence of stroke. So what does an interventional cardiologist have to do with this? Uh, this mainly has to do with the anatomy and the fact that there are potential ways we can modify that uh, to reduce stroke. So just to take you back to anatomy, uh, the atrial appendage is a small uh, cavity chamber that's attached to the left atrium. You can see here in this uh, picture on the left that the left atrium is a fairly smooth structure. There are not, no trabeculations. It's a smooth endothelium where uh, clot formation may be uncommon. But if you look where the arrow is pointing, that's the left atrial appendage. You can see that there are several pectinate muscles there. It's a very trabeculated structure. There's sometimes multiple lobes. And this is the site for thrombus formation. Uh, there's, there's several uh, factors which may implicate this. We know that in patients who have atrial fibrillation, we can see spontaneous uh, echo contrast. It's shown here in my echo on the right. You see how there's that kind of swirling of of, uh, of blood in the uh, left atrium. Uh, that's, that's associated with stasis in the left atrium. Uh, we know that patients with mitral regurgitation actually have less thrombus formation, probably because there are these washing jets going into the left atrium. And finally, we know that there's increased thrombus uh, formation in patients with larger atria. So patients with atrial fibrillation, where the atria is not contracting, is this setup for stasis, which can cause thrombus formation. In addition to that, the left atrial appendage is very uh, uh, trabeculated, which can be a source uh, for and give a substrate for thrombus formation. Here you see, this is a patient I had with rheumatic valve disease, and you can see how there is spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrium, but I draw your attention to the left atrial appendage, and you can see there's actually clots sitting in there. So even though you have this, this spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrium, where the clot forms is in the left atrial appendage. It's pre predicted that probably 75% of patients who have embolic events with atrial fibrillation, that is coming from atrial thrombi. 
The rest is coming probably from extra vascular, vascular sources, such as uh, carotids or the ascending uh, aorta. We know that in patients with rheumatic atrial fibrillation, uh, if you look at surgical studies, that approximately 50, if they have thrombus in their atria, half the time it's in the left atrial appendage, although half the time it's in the left atrium. Again, because they tend to have these large atria, there's a lot of stasis within those chambers. In non-rheumatic atrial fibrillation, however, if you see thrombus in these patients, 90% of the time it's actually in the left atrial appendage. And only 9% of the time is it actually in the left atrium itself. This is the study from which that data is derived. These are patients undergoing uh, cabbage surgery in which a transesophageal echocardiogram was performed or uh, a surgical evaluation was performed. And they found that in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, when clot was formed, that the most of the time it was seen in the atrial appendage and localized to this area, which fits with that concept that the left atrial appendage is smooth, but the uh, trabeculated left atrial appendage is where the thrombus can form. Uh, this is just showing a CT scan, so I'm emphasizing that again. What you're seeing here is the left atrial appendage in the center. You're seeing pulmonary veins off uh, going toward the back of the patient. And up in the upper right corner, it's a little bit reddish. You can see a very trabeculated uh, left atrial appendage. We know that stroke may be associated not only with the trabeculations, but with the number of lobes, the morphology of the left atrial appendage, uh, with the size of the left atrial appendage, or with the flow velocity. You can imagine that if a patient with atrial fibrillation does not have a high flow within the atrial appendage, that that's also more likely to create stasis, which may lead to thrombus formation. There is a wide uh, variety in the morphology of these atrial appendages. This is uh, courtesy of one of our uh, faculty here at the University of Washington, just showing that, there's, that no appendage is the same. Now, in cardiology, with our kind of enjoyment of food, we probably carry the analogy a little far by trying to define these. It's like 18th century uh, taxonomy here. But we've tried to kind of categorize these to some extent. And there's, there's a reason for this. Uh, but you, know, you can see that we could call some look like chicken wings, uh, some look like windsocks, some look like a cactus, and there's some that look like a, a piece of cauliflower. The reason why this is important is because there's probably a morphological association between thrombus formation and, uh, and stasis. This is a study by DeBase and colleagues where they looked at uh, 932 patients who are undergoing left atri uh, uh, atrial fibrillation ablations who happened to have uh, 3D imaging of their left atrial appendage. Uh, and they looked basically retrospectively what was the prevalence of stroke in, in these patients. And what they found that if you had the chicken wing morphology, they had the least risk of stroke. And the other morphologies had higher risks of stroke. And in fact, if you just separate out the patients with the chicken wing morphology, for whatever reason, it had the least amount of stroke compared to all other uh, combined. What's most striking about their data is that even in the very low risk patients, so a CHAD score of 0 to 1, in which you'd expect a very low stroke rate, we found that if you had the non-chicken wing morphology, that your stroke rate was 4.6%. So almost four times as high as what would be expected uh, based on morphology. But if you had the chicken wing morphology, that was more consistent with the low end of the spectrum that would be predicted by the CHADS fast scores. You can see here the expected uh, thrombosis rates in patients with CHADS CHAD score of 0 to 1. It's as high as 2.2%, uh, which would maybe cut the difference between these two. So really emphasizing the concept that anatomy may be playing a role in uh, the stroke that we see with the atrial fibrillation. And this is just another provocative picture here showing a nice lump of thrombus sitting in the left atrial appendage. So what about anticoagulation? We know this is the mainstay to reduce strokes in such patients. Uh, these are the studies uh, that we have to date using, looking at anticoagulation and stroke reduction. We're all familiar with the SPAF studies, which were placebo, uh, no therapy versus warfarin, or no therapy versus aspirin. And you can see here on the far left that there's a dramatic reduction in strokes in these patients. In the patients who have novel anticoagulants, you can see there's also statistically significant benefit compared to patients on Coumadin in terms of stroke reduction. And we also know that this is related to their CHADS VAST scores, that if your CHADS score is higher, that the benefits seem to be uh, more pronounced in these patients. And this has led to the guidelines suggesting that mainly in the patients with higher risk of thrombosis, that there's an indication for anticoagulation. But in patients with lower risk, you can see that although there is a benefit from warfarin in these patients, 
that the absolute risk reduction is very small, and so maybe does not outweigh the leading risk associated with anticoagulation. But here's the problem. In the real world, how many patients are actually therapeutically anticoagulated? So this is, uh, these are three studies looking at databases, real world sample of patients, patients who are on Coumadin for, anti for atrial fibrillation, what percentage of the time are they actually therapeutic? In green is the percentage of time that the patients are therapeutic. In blue are the percentage of times that the patients are supra therapeutic. And in orange are the times that the patients are subtherapeutic. So even though we have an effective therapy that in clinical trials shows benefit, it's only being useful 50% of the time. And this is important because we know that patients with elevated INRs are highly associated with bleeding risks. And the patient with low INRs comprise the majority of patients who have thrombotic events. And warfarin continues to be the number one cause for emergency room hospitalizations for adverse drug events. We can see here this so-called treatment uh, paradox that patients with higher CHAD scores are the least likely to be treated with anticoagulation. This again is from uh, a, uh, a HMO database. You can see that in patients with atrial fibrillation, that in the lowest risk population, only 60% of the time are they actually prescribed warfarin. So 40% of the time, patients who have an indication for warfarin are not even prescribed it given multiple risk factors. And as your CHADS risk score increases, in the patients who need it the most, your use utilization decreases. And if you look at a similar population from Medicare claims data, for patients who are initiated on warfarin, by five years, no matter what your CHAD score is, that most patients have, or half of the patients have stopped using warfarin for one reason or another. So although we have an effective therapy, its implementation in real world practice is challenging. One argument may be that the, sub, or the lower use of, of anticoagulation using warfarin may be due to the, uh, the prevalence of NOACs, of, non, of novel anticoagulants, that maybe patients are being switched to novel anticoagulants. What this data shows, interestingly, in the yellow bar across the board, across time, that the number, total number of patients on anticoagulation remained the same. The number of patients with warfarin decreased, the use of utilization of NOACs increased. So simply, you're just changing patients who are already compliant with taking anticoagulation from using warfarin, using NOACs, but you haven't really expanded the uh, implementation of anticoagulation in this population. I think novel anticoagulants are very effective. However, there, there are limitations of those as well. This is the data from clinical trials for these uh, four novel anticoagulants and looking at their discontinuation rates. Now, we know in clinical trials, that is the, probably the highest rate of compliance you'll ever find in a patient population. And even in a clinical trial, highly selected patients, uh, close, uh, close follow-up, that there's approximately a 25% discontinuation rate, discontinuation rate in the clinical trial. What is interesting is that the major bleeding rate was only in the 3% rate, which we would expect. So that there is a high discontinu discontinuation rate above and beyond what you expect from the major bleeding. And this is likely due to minor bleeding problems, patients who have recurrent falls, or other contraindications that may arise, or even just patient compliance. So even in the best case scenario, uh, we're achieving only a 75% implementation rate of an effective therapy. And this is important because we know that the pharmaceutical cost for admissions for super therapeutic INRs or anticoagulation, the inpatient management of atrial fibrillation, the outpatient management of atrial fibrillation is very costly. So the American Heart Association uh, statistical review, they estimate the cost for atrial fibrillation related pharmaceutical cost to be approximately $26 billion. So that leads us to the interventional cardiology part of this talk. How can we reduce strokes by possibly closing this left atrial appendage? I've impressed upon you that the left atrial appendage is likely the nidus for thrombosis in many of these patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. But what can we do to, to prevent that? So this is actually something that's not new. Uh, surgically, they've been doing left atrial appendage resections for many years, uh, particularly in patients undergoing maze procedure. There are several devices that are available. There's the atricure or tiger paw devices to clip the atrial appendage at time of surgery. Uh, but what have their results been historically? It's actually been surprisingly poor. So you can see across the board here, these are several studies looking at surgical atrial appendage closure. 
and the rates of closure are shown in blue. And you can see across the board there's wide variation in the success rates, with some studies showing as high as a 90% success rate and studies showing as low as a 17% success rate. Now what's interesting in this data, looking at it in aggregate, is that there appears to be a dose dependence here. That the higher the rate of uh, left atrial appendage closure, the lower the stroke rate shown in orange. And that the lower the rate of atrial appendage closure, the higher the stroke rate seen uh, postoperatively. Uh, it's very intriguing, uh, but it also raises question about the effectiveness of this strategy. And there is a lot of dismay about this, this approach given the surgical data. Now you can see that the approach does matter, that the success rate of closure is likely related to the surgical technique. Um, the, the graph on the right shows that whether you use a excision, a suture closure, or a stapling uh, closure, change your success rate dramatically. So even though the initial surgical data, data was, this, uh, was concerning, it didn't stop us interventional cardiologists from coming up with possibly million invasive ways to do the, the same procedure. And the advantage of this is that instead of having a patient have an open heart procedure, where there's morbidity itself associated with the procedure, Perhaps we could do this endovascularly. And there have been several companies that have developed devices to try and close the atrial appendage using just a percutaneous approach. What's shown in the upper right-hand corner is a Watchman device. That's the FDA-approved device that I'll be talking to you about today. There's also the Lariat device, where you can put a snare around the atrial appendage and close it off. That's also FDA-approved. There are also several uh, devices that are available in Europe that are uh, in clinical trial at this time. So I'd like to talk to you about the Watchman device, because that's the only device that in the U.S. has been uh, approved for this indication. Let me just talk quickly about the procedure. Basically, it's a percutaneous venous uh, puncture. It's, all I need is a uh, 14 French sheath that goes in the femoral vein. Uh, there are various sizes available for the patients with different atrial appendage sizes. Uh, we do this with transesophageal uh, echo guidance. The procedure takes about half an hour or 30 minutes. It takes longer to intubate the patient than to do the procedure. It's fairly straightforward. We do a transeptal puncture from the right atrium to the left atrium, and then put this plug into the left atrial appendage. And it's, it's a simple procedure. Overnight hospitalization, patients go home the next day and can resume their normal activity. Uh, this is just gonna, I'm just going to go through and show you images from a uh, procedure. This is a very interesting patient. Uh, seven years ago, she had a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, with atrial fibrillation. Her Coumadin was stopped at that point. She did fine for seven years and then had a recurrent stroke. And at that point, her neurologist felt that they were between a rock and a hard place. They did feel that her atrial uh, fibrillation led to a high risk for a stroke, uh, recurrent strokes in this patient who, who actually had a recurrent stroke. But at the same time, she had a hemorrhagic stroke and putting her on anticoagulation was not ideal. And so she was sent to us for atrial appendage closure. You can see here we're using a transesophageal echo to look at the atrial appendage and to size it for our device. This is taking an angiogram of the left atrial appendage. You can also notice how trabeculated this uh, structure is. Again, emphasizing the concern for, for stroke for, or thromus formation within this structure. Uh, this is just a test shot to look at our device and see how well it's placed. And it's fairly subtle, but if you look at the inferior part of our device, uh, we're not covering part of the uh, trabeculi here. So we actually pulled the device back a little bit and we tested it, and this looked like it had full coverage of the left atrial appendage, and we released the device. On follow-up echo, we can see that the device was well-placed, and we also do what we call Doppler color echocardiography to look for leaks from the device, and there are no leaks. This patient's Coumadin was stopped, and she's, she's doing great. Uh, this is just looking at the endothelialization of these devices. In our canine model, uh, you can see that 30 days, there is the beginnings of an endothelial layer across the device. There still is some uh, of the device skirt that's, that's showing. By 45 days, it looks like it's completely endothelialized. And in this one unfortunate autopsy patient, so a patient who died for other causes, other than cardiac causes, on autopsy, you can see that the device was completely covered by endothelium at nine months, which reassures us that we're closing this, this atrial appendage, that we're not leaving something behind that may itself be thrombogenic. So it's important that we talk about the PROTECT AF study. This is the only randomized study that looked at anticoagulation versus left atrial appendage closure. Uh, they looked at 707 patients. Uh, their mean CHAD score is between 2.2 and 2.3. Uh, the patients randomized to the Watchman device 
actually got warfarin for 45 days, aspirin clopidogrel for six months, and aspirin thereafter. And this is important because there were actually some early bleeding uh, events in the device arm. In the, random, in the placebo arm, it was just warfarin with a randomization of INR between two and three. This is the patient population. They were in their 70s. I mentioned their CHAD scores. The third of these patients had high risk for uh, thromboembolism with CHAD scores three and above. Uh, you can see their cardiovascular risk factors are fairly standard for patients in cardiac trials. Uh, and there was an even distribution among the different types of atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal, persistent, and uh, uh, permanent. So here are the outcomes at four years. Uh, we can see in terms of the primary outcome, which included stroke and cardiovascular death, that there actually was a statistically significant benefit for the device arm that's shown on the far left. Uh, this is comprised mainly of strokes. If you look at strokes overall, there seemed to be a benefit for the device compared to warfarin. Now, if you break that down further, if you go to the third column there, it's interesting that the ischemic strokes were higher in the device arm, but the hemorrhagic strokes were dramatically lower in this group. The number of disabling strokes, which tended to be the hemorrhagic strokes, was much higher in the uh, anticoagulation arm. And interestingly, death was higher in the anticoagulation arm. Trying to break this down, it appears that hemorrhagic strokes was a component of that. Uh, but it is very interesting that there was, uh, uh, it wasn't statistically significant, but a numerically uh, different uh, death rate for the two groups. Uh, another thing to note is the increased uh, events in the study endpoint in the device arm. Of course, you're putting a device in, you're subjecting a patient to a procedure, uh, so this raises some concern. That was not statistically different, but it does uh, raise somewhat of a red flag for this procedure. Just looking at the survival curves, you can see that for ischemic stroke, that the device group that I mentioned, there was a slightly higher rate of ischemic strokes in this group. What I'd like to call your attention to is that a lot of that seems to be upfront within the first six months, that once you get past the first six months in this, from the device arm, that the curves seem fairly parallel, that the accrual of, of events is, was fairly early. In terms of cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality, as I mentioned, it was, hot, it was higher in the uh, warfarin group. This appears to be driven a lot by hemorrhagic strokes, but there you can see across the board that there were some other areas, such as uh, pulmonary causes of, of death that were higher in the warfarin arm. So unclear exactly why there was a mortality difference, Certainly in terms of hemorrhagic strokes or bleeding events, there did seem to be a benefit. In terms of the primary efficacy endpoint, you can see that there was statistically no difference between the groups. And the primary safety endpoint, although not statistically different, you can see that there is a concern here that in the very early procedural period that there were more safety events. And what comprised these safety events in the device arm? Uh, there were serious pericardial fusions, major bleeding, device-related ischemic strokes, uh, device embolization, and hemorrhagic stroke. Now, if you look at this table here, they also divided it in terms of early events versus late events. And by early events, they meant within the first seven days. Most of that was in the periprocedural period. Serious pericardial fusions, there were 22 of them. And this is one of the drivers for that safety endpoint. It turns out that the early procedure, there was fewer safety measures to prevent perforation of the left atrial appendage. And the company has tried to address that. Uh, and there was also uh, procedure-related ischemic strokes. In the strokes that occurred, when the events were adjudicated, it turns out that a couple of the events were due to air being inadvertently injected through the catheter or from thrombus forming on the catheter for patients who were not sufficiently anticoagulated at the time of the procedure. So potentially things that can be addressed or a physician could be trained so that we can reduce that early event rate. So because of that early event rate, there were several registry studies and follow-up studies to kind of evaluate that. So going through the history of the Watchman studies in 2002 were the first pilot studies. 2005, that's when the Protect AF study was, was started. They saw that early event rate, and there was concern. The, the FDA had concern about the procedural complications. So a registry study was continued from, from uh, such patients. Uh, there is also the ASAP study of non committing candidates. But because of those early events uh, concerned, there was a follow-up study called the PREVAIL study, almost exactly the same in design to protect AF study. But one key thing they added here was there was a new training requirement for new operators, in which they used safer methods for getting into the left atrial appendage. There are protocols for anticoagulation and flushing of the catheter. 
and they included 50% of their operators here were new operators. They're, in fact, testing this question of can we train operators to be safer? Is, it, is the device-related complications due to uh, a training uh, effect? And they've continued the CAP2 registry. So all told, uh, with the registries in Europe and the registry in the US, in which the University of Washington is one of the main contributing centers uh, for this study, we have approximately 2,400 patients that have been studied, over 6,000 patient years. But I think it's important to talk about the Prevail study because this and all the early events. And we can look at this by looking at the meta-analyses of all these registries and studies that have been performed. Again, these, the subsequent studies look at patients with similar CHADS VAS scores. In fact, they're higher than the previous PROTECT study. Uh, their baseline cardiovascular risk is about the same, as you'd expect. Uh, the PREVAIL study was important because actually there was, they did not see the benefit that they saw in the PROTECT study. In fact, there was possibly a signal for increased ischemic strokes in that study. Now, there is possibility that the warfarin group was abnormally, had abnormally low risk, even though they had a CHAD VAS score of approximately four. There was only one ischemic stroke seen in the warfarin arm in the, during this follow-up. This is also a smaller sample size, so I think it's important to take this with a grain of salt, but it is important to recognize that, that probably the benefit from uh, atrial appendage closure is a reduction of hemorrhagic strokes, and there may be a concern for increased ischemic strokes. But I think it's important to look at the data in aggregate, and I'll show you that in a second. So with regard to the training effect, uh, this is analyzed here. You can see that in the, in the patients with a safety event in the early part of the PROTECT AF study, that that's when the majority of these events occurred. If you look in the latter half of the PROTECT AF study, that only 4.8% of patients had the safety endpoint within the first seven days. And you can see as you move to the registry studies and the PREVAIL studies, where they're looking at these new operators with this new training algorithm, that the, uh, stroke, the early procedure safety event only occurred in 4.1% of patients. And this continues to decline across the board, which emphasizes the possibility that you can train physicians to do this procedure more safely, and that we could obviate some of the early procedural risk. And if you look at the risks such as pericardial effusions or periprocedural strokes, that there were only 1.4% of patients had pericardial effusions in the PREVAIL study, and there were no periprocedural ischemic strokes in that, in that group. So again, I think that there's concerns about the PREVAIL study where there, there, there wasn't a statistically difference, difference in the ischemic strokes, but we did see a difference there that we didn't see in the PROTECT study. But if you aggregate that data together with the CAP registries, we can see that overall, uh, there does seem to be a benefit in terms of hemorrhagic stroke. And there does seem to be a reduction in major bleeds. Ischemic strokes, uh, there is no statistical difference, although possibly a signal for slightly increased ischemic strokes in the left atrial appendage group. And what's more important here is if you look at patients who have high bleeding risk, so these are the list of the forest plot of subsets of patients, patients with high has blood scores, actually there did seem to be a statistical benefit of patients uh, receiving the device over and above or uh, compared to uh, warfarin. And this effect may actually be, um, be, be underscored by the fact if you look at patients six months and out, so after anticoagulation has been stopped on patients, so again, as I mentioned, that in the PROTECT study, that anticoagulation was required for the first six months, or actually for the first 45 days, and dual antiplatelet therapy for the first six months, that that's when you saw most of the bleeding events, that if you look at events from six months out, that the, the improvement in bleeding events was, uh, was even more dramatic in the watchman group, in the device group. So which leads me to the concept that the benefit for uh, the watchman or the left atrial appendage closure device really is in terms of reduction of bleeding, potentially in terms of reduction of strokes and hemorrhagic strokes. The benefit for warfarin, potentially early on, earlier on, is perhaps a slightly lower risk of ischemic strokes, but over the long term, and remember, these patients, if you're anticoagulating a 65-year-old patient, are going to be receiving this medication for uh, 15 to 20 years, that their risk accrues over time. So taking that concept into mind, if you do a cost-effectiveness analysis, and here in blue would be the device therapy, so atrial appendage closure, in green would be novel anticoagulants, and in red would be uh, warfarin, you can see that there, 
the cost of using left atrial plant exposure devices is highest early on. The device is expensive. It costs probably about ten to fifteen thousand dollars. In addition to my fifty dollar physician fee, it's a very expensive procedure <laughs> compared to just putting someone on warfarin. Uh, but over the long term, because you're not accruing these bleeding events in patients, whereas over time you accrue bleeding events with novel anticoagulants and with warfarin, you see that those curves converge and intersect. And that over the long term, in patients who may be a candidate for needing warfarin for long term, may actually benefit from left atrial appendage closure. In addition, I did show you the, the data earlier on, where if you start a patient on Coumadin, by five years, approximately 50 percent of them have stopped it, this might also, uh, this effect may also be even greater in these patients. Because the warfarin only strategy would probably be off warfarin in five years to half of the patients. So as my English degree has led me to quote Latin during a grand round, I think it's important that I quote Hippocrates, who says, ars longa, vita brevis, ars is long, but, our, uh, but life is short. But I think what he meant to say was the left atrial appendage closure is long and warfarin is brevis. So let's put uh, left atrial appendage closure into a larger context. So I showed it how it compares to warfarin. But how does it compare to the novel anticoagulants? And this is, again, looking at the studies of anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation, the SPAF studies showing a dramatic benefit from using aspirin or warfarin versus nothing, uh, the novel anticoagulants showing some modest superiority over warfarin. If you compare the stroke rates in these studies to what we found in the PROTECT AF study, we can see that the results are fairly similar, if not a little bit more dramatic in the PROTECT AF study. Uh, the length of follow-up was a little bit different in the PROTECT AF study, so if you, uh, if, you make, if you give it parity by looking at only the two-year estimated follow-up in PROTECT AF, you can see here this appears to be the stroke reduction. So at the very least, on par with what you see in other studies. What about compared to other trials with clinical stroke reduction? So in patients with hypertension, the SHEP study being the uh, foundational study for this, dramatic improvement with hypertension control in terms of stroke reduction. But if you look at things such as aspirin for primary prevention or lipid reduction for patients with primary prevention for stroke, that the absolute risk reduction is quite modest compared to what we saw in the PROTECT study. So in this context, I think it's a reasonable strategy for patients, given the other therapies that we consider reasonable for stroke prevention. If you think in terms of absolute stroke reduction, you can see here the SPAF studies and the SHEP studies had the greatest absolute stroke reduction. The stroke reduction is seen by considering novel anticoagulants, fairly modest, but still uh, approaches that we would consider reasonable. Here are the absolute stroke reductions seen in the PROTECT AF study. So I think that in the context of other therapies that we might consider for patients for stroke prophylaxis, that left atrial appendage closure appears reasonable. Certainly in patients who have no other option or who are not taking anticoagulation at all, there's certainly a benefit. And if you hypothetically compare these, by looking at the CHADS VAS scores of the patient in PROTECT AF, looking at their actual stroke rate versus what you might expect from their CHADS score, you can see in orange uh, being the estimated stroke risk that there would be a dramatic benefit for these patients. So again, compared to other stroke therapies, I think it's a reasonable thing to consider. Compared to no therapy, I think it is a very important strategy to consider in patients who can't take anticoagulation. And as I showed earlier, that approximately 50% of patients who are started on anticoagulation can't even take it by five years, regardless if it's a NOAC or if it's, uh, if it's, if it's warfarin. I think the ideal patient for, uh, for this strategy, given that meta-analysis I showed that the benefit for bleeding was primarily in patients with high has blood scores, is to look for patients who have high bleeding risk. And this is just showing uh, estimations of bleeding risk by has blood scores. And this is the validation study for has blood. And you can see that the actual uh, observed rate for bleeding in these high-risk patients was quite dramatically, it was quite dramatic. Uh, so I think that the strategy that most people take with this is to look for patients who have high CHADS VAS scores, so have an indication for Coumadin, yet have high bleeding risk for one reason or another, either calculated or through uh, clinical events. Uh, there's an interesting study looking at a network meta-analysis of Coumadin and other anticoagulation strategies. Uh, looking at their benefit. And what they found was that using warfarin or aspirin certainly had a benefit compared to placebo with in, in dramatic relative risk reductions of 35% uh, or 0.35 for or warfarin and 0.64 for aspirin. 
What's interesting, in this network meta-analysis, they also looked at the impact of increased bleeding, and their estimate for treating 1,000 patients would be you'd prevent 28 strokes. We would also have 11 uh, major or fatal bleeding events. So I think this is something to, to keep in mind, that if the bleeding risk exceeds that of the stroke risk, that perhaps another strategy may be viable. Uh, the FDA has approved this device for use in the U.S. Basically, they said for patients who were warfarin candidates who have a high CHAD score, high risk of thromboembolism, for whom there's a reason that you might want to consider an alternate strategy or they have a high bleeding risk strategy, that the Watchman device is very reasonable. So to sum it up, in clinical practice, uh, patients that I might consider for this are patients who have difficulty maintaining anticoagulation, which is much more than uh, you might think. Uh, patients who have lifestyles that might make anticoagulation challenging. Uh, younger patients for whom not only have lifestyle issues that might affect anticoagulation, but are going to be exposed to anticoagulation for a very long period of time and perhaps accrue the risk of bleeding and hemorrhagic strokes over time. Often older, frail patients with fall risk or a polypharmacy uh, with comorbidities or high bleeding risk are considered. Or you can quantify it by looking at patients with high CHADS DAS scores who also have high HAZ-BLED scores. So very briefly, future directions for this uh, technology. Uh, the University of Washington will be part of some clinical trials comparing new devices. There's the AMLET device from St. Jude, which will probably be randomized against the Watchman device. Uh, we're part of the uh, PREVENT clinical registry, and we're also doing some local studies just looking at left atrial appendage anatomy and the risk for stroke in non-AF patients. Uh, finally, there's some interest in using left atrial appendage occlusion for stroke reduction. There's been a small study that if you use the lariat device, we actually snare off and occlude and excise the left atrial appendage, that the incidence of atrial fibrillation goes down. So potentially that this is a source for atrial fibrillation. Again, small studies, but uh, very intriguing. So to summarize, uh, atrial fibrillation is a significant in the U.S. It's highly associated with stroke. Uh, we know that anticoagulation can help, but we know that there are many patients who can't take anticoagulation. We also know that left atrial anatomy, including uh, very trabecular left atrial appendage, or certain uh, morphologies, the non-chicken wing left atrial appendage, may be highly associated with stroke. And given that there are many patients who can't take anticoagulation or who have high bleeding risk associated with this, the left atrial appendage closure uh, can be effective in, uh, in reducing strokes in these patients. And so please let us know if uh, we can uh, have any questions or if there are patients that might benefit from this therapy. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Don, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I was wondering, in patients who are a high risk, like you said, a high has blood score, who aren't on warfarin for whatever reason, what can you talk about this 45 days of warfarin? And, um, and then also, is there any um, data about using NOAX as well or not using any anticoagulation in those patients? So two good questions. The second part with regard to NOAX, there are no studies comparing the device with NOAX or using the NOAX to kind of bridge patients. Um, that's very important because we know that NOACs have a lower bleeding risk than warfarin, so perhaps the benefit, the risk-benefit ratio might be different in these patients. And that's why I showed those other graphs showing the kind of absolute risk reduction in comparison. Going to the first part of the question is that the protocol required that you anticoagulate patients for 45 days. The reason being there's a concern that in these kind of large atria with st static blood flow, you might form thrombus on the device in that period, that might actually be a nidus for strokes in these patients. Uh, I think in general we tend to practice that. Uh, we sometimes use NOAX for such patients if that's what they can tolerate better because we presume that the anticoagulation level you'll get with the NOAX will be similar for this 45-day period. But your real question is, so what about the patient who just absolutely can't take anti anticoagulation? Should this be considered? In clinical practice, we're doing this. In Europe, there's been some small, small registry studies looking at this, showing that it's probably safe to place the device without anticoagulation. I mean, of course, at the time of the procedure, but to follow up with maybe aspirin flavix alone. And that seems, there didn't seem to be a dramatically higher incidence of ischemic strokes in these patients. Not studied, uh, but I think in clinical practice, when you're 
really between a rock and a hard place, as you're describing, I think that you know, it's a reasonable strategy to either use NOACs or to use Aspen Topics alone. The results indicate that this is probably a safe approach, but um, with those, con those caveats and concerns. Compatible, <laughs> yep. So it's 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 well lodged into the heart. Uh, you might get some artifact from the metal. Um, you know, you're not going to get <laughs> arrhythmias or anything from it, and the device won't dislodge. So. But there you go. Three Tesla is fine. <laughs> for, well, for image, yeah. I mean, for three, if it's three Tesla, it's fine. It's fine for one Tesla. 1.5 Tesla, but I mean, your image quality might be degraded a little bit in that area from the artifact. So, but as far as compatibility and safety, it's fine. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is any of this applicable to patients with uh, symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? Absolutely. So if you look in the PROTECT AF study, it was about a third, third, third of paroxysmal, persistent, and permanent. So if you look at stroke data, actually, uh, all three types of stroke are equally associated with, with stroke. All three types of uh, atrial fibrillation are equally associated with stroke. Uh, you know, I think in the patient who might have post-op atrial fibrillation once and never has atrial fibrillation again, you put them on a Holter monitor or an event monitor and they never have atrial fibrillation, that might be its own category. But in patients who have occasional atrial fibrillation here and there, it does seem that their stroke rate is increased and in the studies of anticoagulation that their stroke rate is decreased with that strategy. And in the PROTECT AF study, their stroke rate was also decreased. So I think that, that there does seem to be benefit in that population. So has, has there been any look at, because it was really striking the image of the endothelialization that the device underwent does that happen in the vast majority of these cases? Has it been looked at in terms of whether failure to do so is creating a more thrombogenic sub substrate in the device? So it's a good question. I think the, the anatomical subset, <laughs> the, the, the autopsy subset of, this, <laughs> of the Watchman device is fortunately low. <laughs> uh, you know, there are very few patients where it's actually been looked at for endothelialization. But we have implicit data, one from the transesophageal data that by one year, probably 95% of the patients, the, the atrial appendage was completely closed. So that would suggest that it's probably endothelialized. That the rates of thrombus formation on the device was fairly low. Uh, there are cases here and there that people show with a bit of thrombus sitting on the device. Uh, those are rare, but they can happen. I think that's why, you know, I think it's important to anticoagulate these patients. We can infer from other device studies and other, where animal studies have been done, and you've had, there have been some autopsy uh, studies looking at patients who've gotten uh, atrial septal defect closure devices and things like that. And in the vast majority of patients, it's endothelialized and well scarred in, into the tissue. So it does seem biocompatible. I mean, this is not to say that if you put a device in and there's a lot of leak and it's rocking. I mean, some devices have embolized in the early period. Uh, that was less than half a percent, but there, that was seen in the study. But that was in the early period. Um, but you can imagine if something's not well seated that maybe it might not end up realized, but I think that would be uh, few and far between and fairly uncommon. I have a question on this. Nice, nice talk. So you mentioned it during your talk that, that a, a, a relatively low but not insignificant number of strokes are, are caused by thrombi that do not form in yeah. the appendage or yeah. maybe do not even form in the heart. Right. Obviously, you'd expect zero impact of the watchman on right. those strokes. Right. So how do you account for that apparent yeah, discrepancy? It, it's in the stroke workup. I mean, when we say that 75% are likely from the heart, uh, in those studies are saying, well, 25% of patients had significant carotid disease, intracranial disease, uh, aortic atheroma, mobile atheroma, and whatnot. So in those patients, I would probably not put a watchman in them. Or if, if you're wanting to do overkill, you can do a watchman plus anticoagulation. But they probably need anticoagulation because their strokes are coming from thrombus formed outside the heart. But it's basically in patients where you've done that full workup, there's no aortic atheroma, there's no carotid disease, there's no intravascular disease, 
and you're presuming that it's coming from the heart. I mean, a lot of this is are, are presumptions about where you think the thrombi are coming from. Or if you see you know, scattered MRI in multiple regions where you think that the likelihood of a cardioembolic source is higher, uh, that might be uh, one indication. But you have to exclude other causes. If you have a big thrombus in the LV in a patient with an EF of 20%, you know, that's not a patient that's going to benefit from this thrombus. 